Father, we thank you for another Sabbath. We thank you that you have spared our lives. As we look at your word again, we pray that your Holy Spirit will open up our understanding, that we can understand what is it that you are saying to us, and that after understanding it, we will be so worked up that not only do we want to live the truth, but we want to share the truth, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So in Daniel 2, what would you say the message of Daniel 2 was? Let, 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 me, let me hear how you process it. What would you say if, if someone asked you to give the message of Daniel 2 in one short paragraph? What would you say that message is? The history of the kingdom? The of the kingdom? Yeah, that's, that's a fair response. Mm -hmm. Fair response. So in Daniel 2, we see a king having thoughts about the future. God responding. I am not even sure that the king as much as asked God to reveal it. But because God, as Daniel said, is a God that read the hearts of men. God responded by giving a dream to Nebuchadnezzar. And in the dream, God said, your kingdom will fall. After you, there will be three other kingdoms. Christ will destroy all these kingdoms. He will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. Good night, King Nebuchadnezzar. Then he came to Daniel 2, Daniel 7. And this time he showed, speaking to Daniel, and notice what God is doing, he's amplifying. You see this here? This here it is for when I play my guitar, this is an amplifier. The reason I need that, if I play my guitar, you might not hear it. So what this is going to do, it's going to amplify the sound. Exactly. Right, so when I pick on the string, you can hear it. That's what God is doing in Daniel 7. But almost as if not to bore us to put up an image again with gold and silver and brands, this time he used four animals. May the story fresh, but the meaning the same. And he amplified that vision, reminding us that there will be four kingdoms. They will be destroyed. But he wanted us to focus on a power that will rise out of the fourth kingdom that will affect the lives of every human being on the earth. And so we were able to learn about Rome and uh, the vision of Daniel 7 is gone. Again, and I'm taking the time to bring that up because I want you to think about it. He could have stopped in Daniel 2. There's no need to repeat it if it's not important. But in Daniel 7, he repeated the same vision with the same meaning. And tonight we are going to look at 
the third repetition of the same vision. But again, as if not to bore us, using different symbols to give the message. So that's what we are going to look at tonight. And uh, let's see. Make sure that this is on. Yes, it's on. Okay. What appeared to Daniel, you can turn my mic down a little. What appeared to Daniel in the third year of Belsajar reign and unto what did he liken it? So if you remember, in the first year of Belshazzar, Daniel received a dream. Then, this is the third year of the same king. The third year, God gave Daniel another vision again, and like I said, of the same vision. And what is in important to take note of also is that this vision was meant for your and mine generation, for this time. No wonder Daniel was told to seal it, because in Daniel's time, preaching this would not be present truth. It is for this time so what we are talking about here each night, it is dubbed present truth. Not any and any truth, but present truth. The truth for the time. So let's look on what Daniel saw. Daniel 8 now, so we are out of Daniel 7, and we are now in Daniel 8. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first time. Pause. Did you get that? So Daniel is saying this vision, even Daniel recognized it, even though the symbols are different. Daniel recognized that this vision is, off, is after the order of the one he received the first time in Daniel 7, because Daniel 2 was King Nebuchadnezzar's vision. Verse 2, And I saw in a vision, and it came to pass, when I saw that I was at Shushan in the palace, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in a vision, and I was by the river Ulahai. So if you can imagine, Daniel, and just to give you a little um, feel as to what's happening there, so you're looking at Shushan, right? And you can see those rivers there. So Daniel, in the vision, he finds himself at Shushan, here, by the river of the Ulahai. So, um, that's where he is. Um, either that he, he was there when he received it, and I don't think he was there when he received it, but the vision, it puts him there, and God gave him those um, instructions. So, what first attracted the prophet's attention? So he's there by the river, Ulahai. And something attracted his attention. Daniel 8, verse 3. Then I lifted up my, mine eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river Aram. Ah, so kind of chewing that a little later. So here you have in, in chapter 7, you have a lion, 
You have a bear, you have a leopard, you have a nondescriptive non beast. Now, I don't know what Bible study is to you, so I can't speak for you. I can only tell you what goes on with me. I have said this over the years. If you want to know God, read the Old Testament. So I'll say that to you. For me, reading the Bible is not just reading the Bible and having information. I actually get to know God. I get to know how he talks, how he goes about communicating to us. And you have to kind of believe that he's a funny God. Yeah. I think he's funny. He's not, he, he know how to laugh. Yeah. Uh, ha, ha. Now, now, I know some of you have a difficulty seeing a God like that. And that's why I've said many times that unless you know God, you will not serve him properly. I give the experience of as a young man, when I was asked to sing in church, I would go up there and I would sing and I would make sure that my face was serious. <laughs> and the reason I did that, I felt that to really make God, I mean, show that I'm serious about what I'm doing and God see that I'm serious, I can't smile. I must be serious. Well, you can understand. That was what? That was my understanding about God. So, again, if you have the wrong picture of God, and I have come to understand it very clearly, that one of the reasons we have so much controversy in churches today, it is because you have a group of people who have the picture of a different God. So some, some people don't see a God that smiles. They see a bald-headed man, a little fat, and he's sitting down there, and he's looking like that. Eh? And so that is the God that they can see. So in their reaction to him, in their worship to him, that's how they worship because they can't see a joyful God. So I would challenge you that when you read the scripture, don't just read. Get into the personality. See God's personality. If you write me a letter, I can tell you about your personality, especially if you write me five letters. By, by, I mean, by the time I have, I have read five of your letters, I can tell you about your personality. That's what God is doing in his word. When you read God's word, you get to know his personality. Um, we were answering this question. Daniel said, Then I lifted up my, mine eyes and saw, and behold, there stood by the river a ram, which had two horns. And the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. Now, let's begin right up front to begin to match up this vision with Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. So in Daniel 8, God showed Daniel, notice what's happening. Do you notice that Babylon is ignored? Yes. All right. So he's not going back to Babylon. But, but he's starting from where, what, is the, what does the two horn represent? 
Medes and Persian, one greater than the, the other. You see how God speak? And that's why I'm saying that when you read the scripture, you get an, an understanding of how God communicate to us. Thus, when you're going through the Bible, it makes it easier for you to understand what the Bible is saying, because you know how God send a message to us using symbols, but you are able to find out what they mean. So here, God, he, he comes to Daniel this time, and this time he showed him in the, in the dream a ram with two horns, but the meaning is the same. He is presenting the Medes and the Persians. So here we have now number three, and you're still hearing about the Medes and the Persians. Who did the two horns represent? Let's look at that. Daniel 8 verse 20. The ram which thou sawest, having two horns, are the kings of what? Media Persia. So if you notice what's happening here, that even if you weren't sure over in Daniel 2, you're having what? Some clarification in Daniel 7 and in Daniel 8, that what we talked about in Daniel 2 is correct that it was representing the four kingdoms that would be, um, that would rise up in this earth. That's what God is talking about. And he wants us to understand, especially the last one. What was the ram doing when, uh, what was the ram doing and what became of it? Daniel 8, verse 4. I saw the ram pushing westward. Now think about it. Read slow and think about it. So you're understanding. So the ram is pushing westward, northward, and southward. So that no beast might stand before it before him, neither was there any that could deliver out of what? His hand. But he did according to his will and became great. Here's a question. Let me see how much you're following. So where is the beast? Where is the ram coming from? Ah, uh, here, there. So it's coming from the east. So if we go and we look at the map, you should be able to, to trace what's happening here. Where is Media Persia? Right here, right? Where is west of Media Persia? And by the way, where was it going? Huh? Where was it going? Right? So what was it going to do or who was it going to overthrow? Babylon? Babylon? Greece? Media Persia, you know. All right? Babylon? Okay. So let's look at it. So, Daniel said, I see this pushing west, so it's going this way. But it's pushing south. But it's pushing north. So all of this brown that you see here, what God is telling you is that the Persians, they're going to occupy those. That's, that, those are the area that it's trying to take over. So it's pushing north, it's pushing south, and it's pushing towards Greece, but not in Greece. Notice, not in Greece. All right.
What is the real lesson of historical prophecy? The real lesson of historical prophecy. What God says would take place, no human being can stop it. <laughs> I chuckle. Because somehow Satan has a way of deceiving humanity to believe they can change the course of God. I think it was Jezebel. Do you remember what God said? Dogs will lick your blood by the wall. <laughs> A Jezreel. <laughs> That's why I tell you, you got to, if you want to know God, read the whole Testament. And this notion that some people have that the, that, that, that the Old Testament is, is, is this kind of a mean book. No, you're not reading properly. Something is wrong with you. Because it is in the Old Testament that you see what? The love, mercy, long suffering, and grace of God. Sometimes I feel sorry for him. Because you hear him almost begging, begging Israel, why won't you come back to me? I'll be your God. That's the kind of God you find there. It's not the God that when you walk away from him, he says, all right, go. I don't want you. No, 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 no. I want you back. Come back to me. What is the other lesson? Prophecies are like promises. God is promising that it will happen. And you know, when you read that story in, in, the, old, in, in the Old Testament, and when it came time, and you watch, I always like to watch the plot and see how it's going to happen. And you see everything just come together. Exactly. And right. And then she, she's killed. Yes. And then the dogs came and licked the blood. Right. You see what God is doing, because he's a God that can see. He's seen and he's telling you what's going to happen. Well, that's what he's doing here. And the interesting thing is that you and I living in 2018, most of these, they're already fulfilled. Yes. You would think that our generation would be the greatest believing generation because most of the prophecy are already fulfilled. But yet we are the what? Most maybe stiff-necked, hard-hearted generation. Somebody said that God would have to apologize. If God did something, he'll have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh, okay, okay, yes, yes. Because we're tough. We're tough. What was the next symbol introduced in the vision? Daniel 8, verse 5. And as I was considering... As I was thinking about it, behold, an he-goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground. And the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. So now Daniel, in the vision, is seen this goat, he had seen the ram, and now he's, he's looking, he's standing there at the Eulahai, and he sees these two goats coming together. The he goat has one horn. Now, what is God telling us there? History helps us to look back and understand exactly what he's saying. So what is Daniel seeing there? Mm -hmm. Persia? No. He's seeing Greece. 
But that horn, that great, great horn, is Alexander, the first king, Alexander the Great. Isn't Bible prophecy sweet? So here God is showing us that when the Greeks, when they come, Daniel, I want you to understand that because here's what God could have done. He could have put that big horn there and four others. But he didn't do that. He's explaining to Daniel piece by piece what's going to happen. So that horn represents who? Alexander the Great. So what Daniel is seeing, look, you, you know in Daniel 7 how, how that happened, right? That, that, that the Greeks came and, and uh, fought the Medes and the Persian and they won. Now in this vision now, God is showing it differently. Here is this he goat representing Greek and it's coming from where? The West this time. And it's not touching the ground. You said something that's pretty interesting. I never thought of it that way. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So even though in this vision, he didn't put the wings, but you know in this chapter 7 vision, he gave it four wings. So if it is going to come from the west and didn't touch the ground, we can see it flying. Huh, I didn't think about that. Yeah, makes sense, makes sense. What did the he goat do? Seeing all of this, what is this he goat doing? Verse 6, and he came to the ram, so the he goat came to the ram that had the horns, which I had seen standing before the river, and ran unto him in the what? In the fury of his power. So this he goat is mad. This he goat is strong and he's taken on the Medes and the Persian. Well, so here it is. The he goat took on the Medes and the Persian. What did the he goat, or what did the he goat with the notable horn represent? So let's see if we can. Look at this, Daniel 8, verse 21. You see again how they, if you had any doubts on Daniel 2, if you had any doubts on Daniel 7, you remember what I told you? That God has a habit of repeating and what? Enlarging. So now he's giving you a clearer understanding of who these kingdoms were. Daniel 8 verse 21. And the rough goat, as he's called, is the king of who? Right. We can close shop and go home now. And all you have to do, all you have to do for the rest of your life is just read the Bible and take God at his word and get ready to go home. Amen. So it is the Greeks, right? And the great horn that his between his eyes is the first, first king. king. And you look at history and history will tell you it is Alexander the Great. So here he is. Alexander was a mighty warrior. So, where is the West? You see there? So that's the Greeks here. And they're coming towards Persia. So that's what Daniel is saying. He's attacking Persia. Persia has all this, if you remember, it went north, it went south, and it went west up to the border of Greek. And now Greek, the Greeks are going to take it over. How was the conquest of Media Persia by the by Greece foretold in this symbolic prophecy. How was it 
foretold. Daniel 8, verse 7. And I saw him come close unto the ram, and he was moved with what? Collar against him, and smote the ram, and brake his two horns. Now, if you're sitting in somebody's living room, giving a Bible study, and you read that, what would you tell them that that means? And break his two horns. Defeat them. Because remember, the horns represent what? Medes and the Persian. So what God is showing Daniel to show this end time people is that the Greeks would overtake, beat them, the Medes and the Persians. So the horn is what? The horn is broken, right? And there was what? No power in the ram to stand before him. See? The media Persian, they couldn't stand before the Greeks. But he cast him down to the ground and stamped upon him. And there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. God telling history before it even happened. Note, from the interpretation given, it is plain that the notable horn upon the he-goat represented Alexander the Great, who led the Grecian forces in their conquest of the Medio Persia under the, uh, upon the death of Alexander at Babylon, B.C. 323, there followed a brief period of confusion in the struggle for the kingdom. But the succession was definitely determined by the battle of Ips, Ipsos, or Ipsos, B.C. 301. Alexander's four leading generals, Cassander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, and Seleucus, became his successor. So here we have the horn is broken, and after would come up, notice the way the Bible puts it, not in his power. The four generals, the four kings, were not to come from the family of Alexander, but outside of his family. So the scriptures say it wouldn't be of his power. The vast empire created by Alexander's unparalleled conquest was distracted by the wranglings and wars of his successors. And before the close of the fourth century before Christ, had become broken up into many fragments. Besides minor states, Four well-defined and important monarchies rose out of the ruins. Their rulers were Lysimachus, Cassander, Seleucus, Nicata, and Ptolemy, who had each assumed the title of king. The little horn. Uh -huh. The great horn? Oh, I'm going too fast, right? The, the great horn was broken, and instead of it came up four notable ones toward the four wings of heaven. What would, what, what would that mean, the four wings of heaven? Right, the four corners. Four corners. Good. And you can read that in, in, in that book. Read the history. What happened when Alexander became great? You can look in the middle and, and you know what happened. It's broke, right? Okay.
What was the meaning concerning the four kingdoms coming up after the destruction of the great horn? What was the meaning of that? Daniel 8, 22, 25 to 25. Now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms, see God is telling the prophet, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. Wouldn't come from his family. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fears, countenance, and understanding, dark sentences, shall stand up. What would you match that with? No, no, no yes, but no, tell me the language of Scripture. What would you match that with? Fierce what? Fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. Match it up. You forget that already? It, yeah, I hear it there. Great and what? And terrible and exceedingly strong. You see, the same language, but different vision. And the Lord is giving the same message, the same message. This, what is going to come out of this, is not a nice guy. And... Uh, and Wednesday, we went down. I showed you how to know who it's talking about. You saw it. And you also saw that only one institution in the world that matched that. And that's what? The papacy. The papacy. All right. Verse 24, speaking about this, this, this power now that's coming up. And his power shall be what? Mighty, exceedingly, you see, exceedingly strong. Same as Daniel 7. Shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. I showed you on Wednesday how many millions were killed. I showed you Pope Francis. You got to give him credit. Apologizing for the Christians, that the Catholic Church, matching what God told Daniel would happen, how they have murdered these people. And God, as, as we go on, I'm going to show you what God told John this time. What's going to happen in your day and my day. Verse 25. And through his policy, go read slowly. Lord, please help them to understand. Please. In Jesus' name. Amen. I hope you're juicing that and, and, and really getting it. Through his policy. So this, this power, it's going to have a policy. But the policy is going to be deceptive. Now, let, let me ask you, apart from Seventh-day Adventists, which organization operate the most schools around the earth? Which organization feed the poor? Take care of the poor. Right. You got to understand when you're reading your Bible. Because God wants you to understand. Because once you understand, your face light up. And you're able to share with your neighbor to save them. So God is telling Daniel that this power... It's going to have a policy. And watch what it says. And through his policy, also he shall what? Cause 
What is craft? No, 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 not, not witchcraft. Deception. That's what he's talking about. Through his policy, because of the things he has done, nice things, good things, people are going to be deceived. In my country, when you show this prophecy, for some people it's difficult. Because in Jamaica, the Catholics, they operate kind things in the neighborhood, schools, and, and, and they help. So it's hard for people to see this. It's only when you believe the word of God and you know that God is not what? He's not a liar. So he, he allowed craft to prosper in his hand. And he shall what? Magnify himself in his heart. I showed you that on Wednesday night. He magnify himself in his heart. And by peace, oh watch this. And by peace shall destroy many. What is Pope Francis trying to set himself up to be right now? the peacemaker. We're struggling in this country. Unless the Lord turn things around, and, and, and we're so late, I don't know if things are going to turn around. But we have lost respect in the world. Amen. We're the world that look to America, that when everything is going wrong, you can look to America to be the one that will help. They're not sure now. They're not sure. Because we seem to be what? The tyrant. But didn't the Bible say, oh, no, go, don't go ahead of myself, right? Ah, yes, don't go ahead of myself. Let me patiently wait until I get there. But remember what I said. Now, that we are looking now like a tyrant. And I'll show you that in Bible prophecy. So, he'll speak peace. And the Bible said, when they say peace and safety, what? Sudden, Sudden destruction. destruction. And, and Pope Francis is setting up himself to be the peacemaker of the world. He's moving fast, very fast. And if you're reading, then you see that what I just say is true. Setting up himself as the person the world must look to to solve the world's problem. And leaders now, even in America, even in the uh, America, in the Congress, is beginning to say, we need a man like the Pope to fix things. Uh, you know, when I, when I heard that, I, I, I just have to say, boy, Scripture is true. You can trust the Word of God. You never dreamed we would come there after you realize many of the people I told you, folks from Europe, they came here escaping the tyranny of the papacy. And they said, what, never again. And now they are forgotten. Right. So he shall also stand up against the prince. What is that talking about? Let me hear you break the code. Stand up against Christ. Jesus is a prince, right? And I showed you on Wednesday night how he does that, right? And if anyone here, if you have ever been a Catholic, you know what I'm talking about. You go to the confessional and you confess your sins. That's putting yourself in the place of Christ because there is only one that you should confess to, and that is Jesus Christ, not a man much more a corrupt man because some of these priests listening they're listening to the sins of the people they they their sins are i leave it there i leave it there okay so he shall what he shall also stand up against the prince of princes but he shall be broken. What is that talking about? 
good. And where did you find that in Daniel 2? In Daniel, in Daniel 2, 14. The stone. the stone. And in Daniel 7, it told us that the, the king that will rule with a rod of iron will destroy him. So all three visions ended with Jesus destroying this power. And I'm going to show you that John saw the same thing. The same thing. So, what came up in the place of the great horn? And what did they represent? Daniel 8, 8 and 22. Uh, let's see, I, th I think I have a little mix of it. We'll come back to that. This is dealing with the, if you remember, it had said the four winds of the earth. So that was what happened. All right. All the kingdoms uh, there. Let's see. What came out of one of the four horns? All right. That's what we want. What came out of that? Daniel 8 verse 9. And out of one of them came forth a little horn. Did you have a little horn in Daniel 7? Yes. Right. Did you have a little horn in Daniel 2? Yes. But it wasn't what? It wasn't magnified. Right. So God is magnifying because you must know about the little horn because he's, it's going to be your persecutor these last days. Those who will keep the Sabbath, like the Waldensians, some will be in prison, some will be murdered, but they'll be persecuted because this power opposes what? The laws of God. Remember, I show you that. That's one of the mark. So, it says, And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great. You see that again? Exceeding strong, exceeding great. Toward the what? The south, toward the east, toward the pleasant land. So this power is moving in uh, those directions, and we'll see something soon. What came out of one of the four horns? That is that horn that came out, the little horn. But the Bible said that little horn wouldn't stay little. It would what? Wax great. And it moves towards the pleasant land. So, if you, um, it says that the Roman Empire, as the little horn, came out of one of the four horns of the Greek Empire. The horn is came, it came out of, was? Cassander, the ruler in Macedonia. That, that's up here. So that's where the little horn came from. And it moves towards, and it moves towards. And so, if you, uh, someplace in here, you should have the Holy Land. And so it moved in that direction also. So that's the, that's the Roman Empire at, at its height. So all the red is the Roman Empire. So Daniel saw it. It came and uh, it waxed great. In 500 BC, Rome was a minor city state on the Italian peninsula. By 200 BC, the Roman Republic had conquered Italy. And over the following two centuries, it conquered Greece and Spain. The North African coast, much of the Middle East, modern day France, and even the remote island of Britain. In 27 BC, the Republic became an empire which endured for another 400 years. Finally, 
the cost of holding such a vast area together became too great. Rome gradually split into eastern and western halves. And by 476 AD, the western half of the empire had been destroyed by invasion uh, uh, from Germanic tribes. The eastern half of the empire, based in Constantinople, continued for many centuries after that. And you can re read uh, Lee's book and, and get more of the history. Jesus Christ's birthday, birthplace in Bethlehem became part of the Roman province of Judah during Christ's lifetime. As a result, Christianity emerged there and spread during the early Roman Empire. One of the most peaceful and prosperous eras of the ancient world, the early Christians faced suspicion from Roman officials. The biggest problem was that, as the late historian Chester Starr puts it, Christians were expected to sacrifice to the emperor or to be gods for the emperor. To the Christian, this act was one of pagan worship. To the imperial bu bureaucracy, bureaucrat, thank you, simply a profession of patriotism toward the figure who embodied the state. So Christians faced persecution off and, and on. From the reign of Emperor Nero in 64 AD until 313 AD. But as this map makes clear, Persecution didn't stop the spread of Christianity. So that gives you a little background. So, there you're looking at it. The bright, the darker blue, it is the Christian area in the, in the empire, the Roman Empire. And the light blue are the areas that was Christianized. So that's what was happening. And working along with prophecy. How did the little horn behave? Daniel 8, verse 10 to 12. And it waxed great, even to the host of heaven. And it, and it cast down some of the host, and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. What is the host of heaven? Or who is the host of heaven? Huh? Well, how, how did it cast down the angel? When the Bible says the Lord of hosts, what would that mean? Who is the host? His people. His people. Because if you miss that term, then you miss the, you miss the, meaning, the meaning of the message. The host, when, when it speaks of the host, it's talking about God's people. So, huh? Well, it, 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 it seems so. And it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. Right. So Jesus is the what? The prince of his people. Right? And by him the daily sacrifice was taken away. And I, I, I just explained that. You, you know, the daily sacrifice, it's talking about what? The priestly work of Jesus in the sanctuary. And so this part would take it over. 
by offering to forgive sins. And so the daily sacrifice was taken away and the place of the sanctuary was cast down. So, um, and an host was given, I'm, I'm sorry, and an host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression. And it cast down the truth to the ground and practice and prosper. So what this is telling us is that as this power tried to do, do this, it would prosper, meaning it would happen. Because as we will discover in days to come, you know, when and how long God said that, that would, it would happen. So the little horn walks great. As you can see, Christ the prince place was taken by instituting what? The confessional. And many of you know what this is kind of funny. The little boy, he went to confess. So the priests, you know, say, okay, so what do you want to? And so he said to the priest, you go first. <laughs> That's kind of a joke, right? In other words, in other words, the priest, he should confess first. Yes. Right. Okay. <laughs> Christ is what? The only intercessor who can forgive sin. John 1, 29. The next day John sees Jesus coming unto him and saith what? Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. No man can do that. Only Christ as the high priest. Only Christ. So, I showed you on Wednesday night where this, this um, power, it would what? Cast God's law down to the ground. And I had a slide I was going to show you, but uh, it's in another thing. I wanted to put both. I, I might do that another time. I wanted to put your Bible before you and the Catholic Bible and to show you how they have changed it. So they end up with what? With ten. ten, like the Bible has ten. But how did they get to ten? They split the last one into two. And they took the second one out. Why did they take that one out? Because it talks about idol, and when you go to the Catholic Church, you see, right? Idols, right? In my undergrad, I had to go to, uh, you know, a kind of a Catholic church and sit in the service, and then I think I had to write a paper. And so you see people come, and they have idols, maybe at the side, and, and you see them walk up, and they, right? You're not supposed to do that. So they took that out of their commandment. And they split the last one into two. And thus they have ten. And so we're told that it would what? Stamp on God's commandments. And remember I told you, you can't do away with, it. You can't do away with the laws of God because they are his character. Thou shall not steal. Show that God, he doesn't steal. All ten commandments deal with his character. But Satan would like to destroy that. So it shows us that this power, Christians, by this power, Christians were thrown. Read that. Uh, it's, it's a good read. It's a good read. And you can still see, uh, you, you can still go there and see ruin of, of that. You, you know, where they would throw the Christians and then let the lions loose. And it would kill. And some of these are going to come back because Satan is going to use his, his old successful tools on one last time. Yes, all kind of atrocities took place by this little horn. I mean, you, you read history and your blood may curdle. Curdle. And you see you know, 
Right, read the Fox's Book of Martyr. <laughs> read that. You see this man walking around and, uh, you know, acting like a holy man, and they call him Holy See. Now, it, for, for Adventists who have been studying, when they see that, it might only get them upset because they know it's not a holy man. See, because if you remember what I read, Great Controversy, it says nothing has changed. But what she has done, because she received a wound and because she was unpopular, she went undercover and she tried to be nice so as to gain its power again. And now it has its power. And some of the brazen things that, you know, that the Pope is saying, he's, e he's even having problem I among his own people. It shows me that they have, they feel secure that they gain the power again. And so they don't have to hide. But yes, it was a bitter time, bitter, bitter, bitter time. Yeah, you can read about that. Um, you, you remember Huss? Yeah. Huss came into town, let me see. Yeah, Huss came into town, they caught him, and they burned him at the stake. Jerome came to look for his friend, and they caught him. And when they put him in the dungeon, when they brought him up for trials, um, he said, could you give me just a minute to have a word of prayer? No, I'm sorry. I'm mixing it up. Okay, so they, they took him out, brought him before all the dignitaries. And they said to him, if you recant, your life will be spared. And Jerome, he was afraid. And he said, I will recant. Did they free him? No. no. They placed him back in the dungeon. And when they brought him the second time, you remember what happened? Jerome said, can I just have a minute just to have a word of prayer? And they allowed him. And Jerome knelt and he prayed and he asked God for strength. And when he got up, he let them have it. They took him out and they burned him. And history says that Jerome, he was, he was singing. And when the fire lit around him, they could hear his voice until there was no sound. And we we're told that as they would burn God's people at the stake, they would throw their ashes in, in the river. And it seemed like as the ashes go down the river, and as people watch, people burn at the stake, people say, I want that kind of God. I mean, if they can, if they can stand that, for their God, I want to know that God. So all they're burning, all they're burning at the stake only brought more to Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Yes, and so that's what happened. People were burned at the stake. After seeing the vision, what did Daniel do? Verses 15 and 17. And it came to pass... When I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning, then, behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the bank of Ulahi, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. Verse 17. So he came near where I stood. And when, I, and when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall the vision be. You remember I explained that earlier? There's a difference between the time of the end and the end of time. Since 1798, we have been living in the time of the end. Why did I say that? Sorry. 
president in 1798. Yeah. And, and, um, and, the, and um, he got received a deadly wound. Uh -huh. yeah. And what happened? And um, the Reformation and, um, started at that. And the book of Daniel began to unfold. And so that marked the time of the end. Because Daniel was promised that he would stand in his lot at the latter end. So since that time, there have been prophecies, seminars, what? All over the world. The book was open. And so um, Daniel was told that this is, the angel told him, this is, this message is for this, these people, end time people. When was Daniel told this vision is for? Verse 19, he said, and he said, behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation. So that's where we are, in the last end. And you have a world that don't recognize it. So when you tell people that they're here in the last, this is God's last message for a perishing world. Many, I, I imagine, they don't believe. That's why Jesus said, I'm going to come as a thief. It's not to those who are on his side. They will know. That's why Paul said, we are not in darkness. Jesus is coming as a thief to those who are not watching. So, so, um, Ruel, if you could go to the computer and I put there um, this slide, another program that has our closing song. And so if you can take this one, just before you do that though. So here it is, Daniel 2, right? And so yeah, if you need to take a picture, do that. Daniel 7, Daniel 8. Now. What is interesting, but I won't be doing that because I don't have time. Daniel 11, Daniel 12 is another study. And if you notice what's happening in Daniel 12 and 11, do you notice what's there? All crowns. No metals, no animals. But because Daniel had prayed that prayer in chapter 9. An angel was sent to give him the meaning, a broad meaning of this vision. So you have that in chapter 11 and chapter 12. And so what you have in chapter 11 and 12 are crowns. So there you have, okay, there you have the spread. And I think that, all right, so he's going to change that and we're going to sing our song that we have not done for two nights because we were trying to not hold, not hold you over the time.